How are you guys? Welcome back to Wargaming China. And today, as you can see, I'll be talking about the Hargo. Now, usually I don't venture into territory like this, but um, because, you know, I'm not an expert on Japanese armored, armored vehicles. You know, my expertise is more the Chinese forces. But however, today, I was rained off work and I came home early and I just thought, okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna paint some of my Hargos. Now, as you can see, some of my Hargos are painted for the Philippines. Some of my Hargos are painted for the SNLF in Shanghai in 37. And others I'm still yet to paint. Um, I haven't decided how to paint them. I've been going through my books, reading articles, I've been on YouTube, looking at channels, you know, even places I don't usually go, like, you know, um, the Tank Encyclopedia. And I'd like to first off say about the, tank about the Tank Encyclopedia, I'd like to thank Mark, Marco Pantelic and Mark Nash. They did a, a video on YouTube about the Hargo and it was very revealing and it revealed things to me that I had not previously known about the Hargo but it did raise another question and I do have a very good question for the authors of these books and also a question for Marco Pantelic and Mark Nash. Now First off, as I said, I'm not an expert on AFVs, Japanese AFVs, but I do have a lot of books on them. There's a lot of information available. I'm not somebody who buys a book in 1995 and thinks that nobody could add to the subject 27 years later. So um, what, I what I learned from the Tank Encyclopedia video that is not mentioned in any of the books is that in fact the Hargo has a few questions that if you read that if you're well read not only on Japanese armor but on um, the structure of the Japanese industrial complex you know I've actually took almost a uh, anthropological look at the Hargo okay so first off, there's a lot of contradictory statements about the Hargo. Um, so production began in either 35, 1935 and 1936, according to which author you read. And um, between 1100 to 2600 were produced, depending on which author you read. Now, all of this makes the Hargo one of the most, manu the, the number one Japanese tank as far as manufacturing goes. They didn't produce any tanks in larger numbers than the Hargo. Now, when the Hargo was operating in China, in Manchuria, they found there was a problem with a very simple, a very simple problem with the suspension system. Now, as you can see on the Hargo, it had a very good suspension system that wasn't a torsion bar. There was no uh, mechanics for it inside the tank, just one drive shaft at the middle of the tank. So the three-man crew, when they were operating in Manchuria, discovered that when these tanks were going through the sorghum fields, the furrows of the crop were exactly the distance of between the wheels, which made the ride very, 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 very bumpy. You know, they seriously unstabilized the tank. So what the Japanese did for Manchuria and for China is that they put a third road wheel between the two main road wheels. This was to level off and increase the smoothness of the drive. Now this feature of the Hargo was only used in China. It's called the Manchu modification. Now, um, which means that all of my tanks are not the right ones for China. If they went to China, they would have the th uh, an, an extra wheel between the two suspension systems. 
Now, that's not the only thing that, um, that I learned when I was lining up these tanks to do a paint job on them. Now, if we look at Japan's first tank operations, we have to go back to Manchuria in, between September 1931 and February 32, between the operation of um, this fall of Mukden to the fall of Harbin. Now, if we look at the weather in Manchuria, we can see that in the winter, and indeed there are many, there are many written uh, accounts of this, that um, many of the Japanese um, many of the Japanese operations and battles were conducted in minus 30 degrees weather. Now, you don't really get much snow in the north of, si of, the north of Manchuria because the winds come from uh, Siberia and they don't bring any moisture. So that means that no matter if it's minus 30 in Manchuria, it's very rare to get uh, a long and deep snowfall. But however, we have to realize that a chill that minus 30 degrees is very, very cold. Now I live in New South Wales in Sydney and 30 degrees minus 30 degrees to sorry so Manchuria has temperatures that range from minus 30 degrees up to 30 degrees now this is very um, if you're from the northern hemisphere 30 degrees sounds hot but if you're from the southern hemisphere you know that um, especially like in Sydney or parts of Australia or much of the Pacific temperatures in the summer go well above 30 degrees now, this leads me to a question. All of the books that mention asbestos insulation, they mention asbestos insulation, and they all say the same thing. The insulation was installed in the Hargo to protect against the heat of the campaigning in the Pacific. Now, as you, as you know on this channel, I like to think we can, I can contribute something and sometimes the only thing I can contribute is a question. But it's a very good question. In 1936, when uh, production started of the Hargo and it was given asbestos insulation, at that time the Japanese army had not studied any of the factors that would be involved in jungle warfare or in um, hot climates and if we look at the Japanese army in the early 1930s we can see that they have a lot of equipment for the winter but they're still wearing their same plain woolen uniforms in the summer so why do historians and tank riders and people who talk about AFEs as experts and remember I'm not an expert I just platform what I think and then hopefully you guys can get back to me. So, we're gonna look at this book now. Now this book by Colonel Maso, Masanobu Tsuziji states that the Japanese army did not look at the problems of jungle warfare and, and uh, the problems of fighting in the Pacific until they opened the Jungle Warfare School on Taiwan in 1941, in early 1941. So why again do authors say that the Hargo was insulated for the heat? When the Japanese had had the tank in production for many years already, although in small numbers, and had already put asbestos insulation in. So the asbestos insulation in the Hargo is for the winters in northern China. It's to protect the crew from the harsh cold. Now, it would have been very cold in Hargo because all the vision ports don't have uh, glass blocks in front of them, they just let the weather in. And of course, it would have been very hot in Hargo in the summer, but not, not any hotter than it would have been in a, 
a Grant or um, a Lee Tank or a Sherman or indeed any closed top, closed down AFV. So it's my opinion that um, the Japanese insulated this tank for the winters of Manchuria just like when they modified the tank with the drive wheel it was for Manchuria because that was the only place where these tanks where the Japanese had where the Japanese had any uh, knowledge of what they would need to do with armored warfare let's remember that when the drive and harbin had included the NT27 petrol engine French tank the Japanese had um, decided that petrol was too flammable for operations and quickly dodged the NC27 and decided that all their tanks from now on would be produced with a diesel engine. Now one more question about the um, Hargo. In many of the books that I've got it states that the ammunition for either the 6.5 millimeter or the 7.7 millimeter machine gun the tank could carry between 1100 and 3600 rounds. Now, you'll see the 3600 rounds talked about in the tank with the 7.7 millimeter machine gun. Now, the question I would like to ask the authors is, do you really believe that um, inside of a Hargo, there was space for, how many? 20, 50 magazines of 30 round ammunition for the tank's machine guns. Do you really think there was space for the tank, considering how small it is, for that amount of machine gun ammunition to be stored in it? That's a question again, I'd have to look. There are people that are restoring um, Hargo's now. I'd like to get in touch with them and ask them the layout of the tank. But it seems very hard to believe that the Hargo could carry in the event of 3,600 rounds over a hundred magazines for its machine guns. I just don't see it. Now, uh, another question that comes up about the Hargo is why was the Hargo, why is it that the Hargo seems to be not as effective as dealing with anti-tank rounds as the Type 94? Because it is for one reason, the Hargo when it was first produced as a prototype, you will see pictures of the prototype, there's a lot of um, these curves are not there, they're flat. The tank is very square and it weighed seven and a half tons in the prototype stage. They wanted to lighten it, so they made it six and a half, thousand, six and a half tons. Now, the way, the way they did this was obviously by changing the amount of armor. I mean, it could be the only thing explainable. But we have to remember that Japanese face hardened armor as used in the Type 94 was superior to um, Allied face or even German face hardened armor up to 11 millimeters. Now we say to ourselves, well, Adam, the Hargo has got 13 millimeters of armor, and that's correct. And that is because the Japanese used rolled homogeneous armor for the production of the, of the Hargo. Now, Japanese rolled homogeneous armor was inferior to Allied or German rolled homogeneous armor. So 13 mils of rolled Japanese homogeneous armor is not as um, resistant to shells as 11 millimeters of Japanese face hardened armor. And you must remember too that in the early 1930s, the Japanese had a, had a steel shortage of where they were really scrambling for steel. And it says in many books, because I like metallurgy and small arms, and it says in many books that the Japanese had found it very, very difficult to produce, to produce curves in their herald homogeneous armor. Um, they did it, but the question is, you have to ask yourself if you study metallurgy, as you go around the curve of these tanks, is the hardness of the armor the same all the way around? And we've got to answer. We've got to answer with the look, with the technology available to the Japanese to work. it probably wasn't. It probably wasn't. And it was these curves that weakened the Hargo, so that it was only as good 
I mean, it was still a good tank. The 37mm proved itself at Kalkin Gol, Nomenham against the Russians. But the armour, the Russian anti-tank guns, 45mm tanks, could defeat this armour very easily. So we have to ask ourselves... We have to ask ourselves why the Japanese went for rolled homogenous armour when face hardened armor was, was, was more effective and could be produced cheaper. It's because they wanted a more modern design aid where they were desperate to get some weight off this tank from where it was going to operate. And to be to, to be honest, this tank was in service for three years before they discovered that it, you know, that it wasn't as good as what they thought when it met the Russians. Now this tank was in service until 1945, so you know, it had a long service. But um the questions about the Hargo, the contradictions and um, conflicting information about the Hargo will always be there. I can just ask a question, and as my question states, if the Japanese only experience of armoured warfare was in the cold of Manchuria, why do modern authors believe that the armour was put in for the heat of the Pacific? I don't think it was. So that's it, that's the Hargo. Um, nothing much I could add to what other authors have added, but you know, there's a question for you. When you have that many books and you've read them all, you are entitled to ask questions. And if we don't ask questions, knowledge won't, won't grow. So as I said, keep your um, research material recent and relevant and ask questions. All right, well, that's all for me for now. Um, if you like that, please press like. Remember, this is not a pay channel. This is a free channel. So, you know, I'd, I'd like you to press like. I'd like some contributions about what I've just said. And, you know, if I can get a few more subscribers, I'd like that too. To the 79 that have subscribed, well, you are legends. All right, that's it for me. Take care. Bye.